Jesus Christ. My name is Fred Jordan, and I'm a retired United Methodist pastor and part of the First United Methodist Church congregation. In fact, I was baptized in the old sanctuary of this church as an infant, and this has always been my church home. Pastor Mark is away this morning with his family. I hope all of you are staying safe this morning. The roads in Rowan County are unsafe for traffic. We've even pre-recorded this service so that no one would have to take any personal risk for celebrating God's presence. The service is a little different because of that and because, well, I'm not entirely comfortable with this order of worship. So, so uh, bear with me and sing out loud wherever you are and join in the praising of God. Now, for those of you who are visiting our service this morning, welcome. We're glad you're here. We are honored by your presence and hope to see you again. A few quick announcements. The church office will be closed tomorrow for a Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Ministry music rehearsals will be held this week, next week, uh, weather permitting. The flowers adorning the chancel are lovingly given to the glory of God by Rusty, Ben, and Bruce Greenland in memory of their parents, Mary Ann and Bob Greenland. I think it's safe to say that all the church activities the remainder of today have been rescheduled. Watch your email and the church webpage for further announcements. The bulletin or worship guide is available at our church webpage. You may also want to light a candle where you are as a reminder that your home is part of God's holy sanctuary this morning. God is present where you are. So let's worship together our Heavenly Father.
Please stand for the responsive greeting. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Let us praise the Lord together. The sun shall no longer be our light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on us. For the Lord will be our light, and our God will be our glory. The Lord will be our everlasting light, and our days of sorrow will end. Come, let us sing to our light and salvation. Our opening hymn, number 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us humbly confess our sins before God and one another. Almighty and merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and one another in both our actions and inactions. We recognize that in Jesus Christ, our light has come. Yet often we choose to walk in shadows and ignore the light. Gracious God, forgive our sins and remove from us the veil of darkness that shrouds our lives. Illumined by your word and sacrament, 
May we rise to the radiance of Christ's glory. Amen. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. illumination as printed in the worship guide. Shine your truth into our lives, O God, sharpening our awareness of your abundant gifts and attuning us to the signs by which you would lead us. As heirs of your promise, we seek to be guided by your eternal purposes, that the church may make your wisdom known through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, the 62nd chapter, beginning at verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nation, the nation shall, shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Here ends the reading. If there are children in your house, you might want to ask them to come by for just a minute if they're not watching and uh, see what I want to tell them next from the children's message. In fact, uh, you adults might want to hang on and listen too because I've had adults tell me that this was the one part of the sermon they actually understood. I have a pitcher of water, just pure Good old Salisbury water. My dad used to call it Adam's Ale. On a hot day, it's nothing any finer. Of course, today it's uh, more frozen of the type. But I have just plain water. And sometimes that's all I want to drink is just a plain glass of water. But there are other days when you can improve on that water. And I'm going to improve on it by putting some grape drink artificial mix into it. Watch what happens. And what was water, with a little bit of luck, will soon be beautiful grape juice. We'll even start to change the color. And it's got lots of sugar in it. And water's good, but this is even better. And as it changes colors, we can pour it into our drink. 
and have a tasty glass of, orange ju of, of grape juice. Now, this reminds me of a story that we're going to be talking about in our service today where Jesus went to a wedding in Cain of Galilee and he turned buckets of water into glasses of wine. Now, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by some artificial flavoring that went into it. But here's the point I want you to remember. When you let God's love enter your life, when it touches you in your heart, it can change you just as surely as this artificial flavoring changed plain water into good-tasting grape juice. God loves you, God cares about you, and God's love can help make you be the person that God wants you to be. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us, and thank you for loving our children, and thank you for loving us so much that love can transform us into new and wonderful people in God's family. Amen. Y'all can be seated. St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. 
to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit, which allots to each one individually, just as the spirits choose. Here ends the reading. lesson for today is found in John, the second chapter, reading verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This 
the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Alfred K. Newman died several years ago in New Mexico. That was Alfred K. Newman, not Alfred E. Newman, for you mad magazine fans. Alfred K. Newman was one of the last surviving members of the Navajo Code Talkers. He was one of some 350 Native Americans who used their difficult-to-understand language to form an indecipherable code. Their linguistic heritage was a key factor in American military victories in Iwo Jima, Saipan, and other major Pacific battles. It sounded like gibberish to the Japanese, but to those who understood the code, it was the key to victory. The same confusion happens today when many modern people read today's gospel lesson. I mean, it sounds like gibberish. Doesn't make sense. All they hear is an unbelievable magician's trick. How could water become wine? We want to know how Jesus did it because anyone who can turn water into wine could make a fortune in the commercial market. In fact, more than one writer has tried to explain this story as a commercial venture. Some have even suggested that after her husband's death and after her eldest son wandered off to become an itinerant preacher, Mary, the mother of Jesus, opened a wedding catering business. I mean, she had to support herself some way in her old age. The text doesn't say that. It's just conjecture. But the idea offers a plausible explanation as to why Jesus was at the wedding feast and why his mother was so upset when the wine ran out. A disaster like that could ruin a catering business. Perhaps that's why in all of my parish ministry I never preached on this passage. Well, I've taught about it in Sunday school classes, but I've never attempted to preach on it. It's complicated and difficult to understand. And I'm preaching about it this morning because Mark's invitation for me to preach reminded me to take another look at the lectionary. And this is today's lectionary gospel passage. It marks the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. It was as though God was saying, Fred, it's time you did a little work for a change. It's time you did more than preach one of your old sermons. It's time to dig deeper and decipher what this passage really means. When I did that, I discovered a powerful message we all desperately need to hear. Yet to hear that deeper message, you have to be a Christian, just like you had to be a Navajo to be a code talker. Understanding the story requires some basic knowledge about Jesus and about things that most non-Christians don't know anything about. You have to dig below the surface to see this tale as more than a magician's trick. You have to do some hard work to hear a spiritual message, a message that's a lot more than helping your widowed mother out of a financial jam. So, 
Let's take a second look at John's account of the Canaan wedding ceremony. The first question we need to ask is, why did John include this story in his gospel? I mean, you won't find it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. It's not part of the synoptic tradition. This story is unique to John. If you know anything at all about John's gospel, you know that he only includes what is absolutely necessary. He never wastes words. He doesn't tell us everything we need to know about something. Just tells us what we need to know. I'd like to know, for example, why Jesus was at the wedding in the first place. I'd like to know a bit more about his mother Mary. I'd like to know if Jesus was the reason the wine ran out when he showed up with uninvited guests. John leaves a lot out of the story. But everything he puts in the story is important. If you've ever studied the gospel, John, you know that of all the gospels, John is the one most concerned with Christology. That is to say he cares more about the identity of Jesus than he does about the ethical teachings of Jesus. John's gospel takes us beyond the stories of just an itinerant rabbi and lifts our vision so we see the Son of God. And when we dig deeper into this text, what we see is a divine Jesus, and we see the coming of a messianic kingdom. John doesn't even call it a miracle story. He says ancient world was full of miracle workers. Miracle stories were common in the first century. This is not a miracle story. John calls it a sign. And signs always point to something. A traffic sign warns us of a railroad crossing, of passing lanes, of falling rocks. This passage is a sign. It points beyond itself to the coming kingdom of God. And to understand the sign, we have to dig deeper for the eternal truth. So let's look at the clues. The passage begins on the third day. Does that sound familiar? Jesus died on a Friday, the first day. He was buried in a tomb the second day. He rose from the dead the third day. Here at the very beginning of his ministry, John reminds, reminds us of how the story ends. Next, John places the story at a wedding. Now, weddings were joyful occasions that usually lasted for days. Pity the poor father of the bride. Jesus often compared the kingdom of God to a wedding feast. You probably remember the parable of the wise and the foolish maidens where some didn't bring enough oil for their lamps and couldn't be admitted to the wedding feast. That's Matthew 5. 9, verse 15. There's also the parable of the wedding banquet, where all were invited, but many made excuses as to why they couldn't come. That's Matthew 22. And when asked about the failure of his disciples to fast, Jesus said, the wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. That's Matthew 9, 15. Over and over again, Jesus describes the kingdom of God as a happy, joyful wedding feast. Do you see the sign? Do you see what it's pointing to? 
Wine also symbolizes a celebration. Now, we're more familiar with the abuses of alcoholic beverages, but in ancient times when clean water was often unattainable, wine was a normal beverage. The Old Testament is full of images of wines and all kinds of celebrations. Wine was essential to every really good party. So when the wine ran out, it was a social catastrophe. That's when Jesus' mother intervenes and enlists his reluctant assistance. Something very ordinary becomes extraordinary. Now, in that world, clay jars were used for drinking water. Yet John specifically says that the water was in stone jars. That's important. Stone jars were only used for ritual cleansing. And when we look deeper, we realize those stone jars represent the ancient Jewish law. Jesus orders that they be filled to the brim. That's about 30 gallons worth. We're now talking about 180 gallons of the very best wine, and that's enough to keep any party going for a very long time. Can you see what's happening? John is telling us that the Old Testament legalism is about to be replaced by something far better. What is past is about to be changed, to be, to be transformed by Jesus. The story is nothing less than a sign that points us to a creating God who is not yet finished with this world. Jesus is not just another magical miracle worker. Jesus is God's son who transforms Jewish legalism into exciting new religion of the human heart. So what's the message here for us? Why should we care about this deeper meaning? We care because this text invites us to become part of that new kingdom to taste the new wine that is so much better than the old. It invites us to experience the joy of following Jesus and the transformation of new birth. And if we accept Christ's invitation, it promises us that we will be gloriously happy and constantly in trouble. Well, you see, there are two things that jump out from this lesson, two things that can change your life. The first is a transformation from a religion of rules to a religion of righteousness. It's what St. Paul called a transition from a religion of law to a religion of grace. Judaism believed in legal obedience. It had a law for everything. And what started out as Ten Commandments had become an oppressive legal system of works righteousness. To be a really good Jew, you were supposed to keep all the laws. It was impossible. But there's nothing wrong with rules or regulation. When I grew up here in Salisbury, my family had lots of rules. I bet yours did too. I was expected to obey them. Yet rules could only alter my outward actions. They couldn't touch my heart. They couldn't change the person I am inside. But you see, that's what Jesus does in this story. He changes us from the inside out. And he did by keeping religion simple. He said we should love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. He said to do more than it's expected and by going the second mile, by turning the other cheek 
and by loving even our enemies. In John chapter 13, he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I love you. That's the new wine of the gospel. You know, I think it's tragic in our time that so many Christians and so many Methodists want to return to the comfortable certainty of a legalistic religion. They like the smug arrogance of a rule-based faith and look down on anyone that doesn't measure up to their community standards. The United Methodist Church is being torn apart over issues of human sexuality. Too many Methodists have extracted a few verses from the Levitical law codes and have made absolute obedience to those laws the most important religion issue facing 21st century Christians. But that's not the new wine of the gospel. It's not strict obedience and compliance with the Torah that makes us right with God. It's the love in our hearts for one another, even for the person who is different from us. That's the new wine. And that's living under the rule of God's love. And the second point I want to have you remember concerns the joy Christ brings to life. I mean, I mean what you think it means. To enter the kingdom of God fills your life with joy, uh, but it's not one long party with Jesus. Remember the mention of the third day? The opening verse, it's not always easy to be a Christian. There may be a cross in your future. Following Jesus can get you into trouble. It can even get you killed. But there's always with Jesus a third day. There's always a celebration, an Easter morning. Tomorrow is a national day to remember Martin Luther King, Jr. His daddy was a preacher, and young Martin was reared in the church. He was educated in a Methodist seminary, served God as a Baptist preacher. He stood for nonviolence in the face of racial oppression. He taught his followers to love their enemies, and his stand for human rights ultimately got him killed. In the spring of 1964, I was a first-year student at the Duke Divinity School. That April, Duke hosted a major convocation on Jürgen Moltmann's powerful new book, The Theology of Hope. It affirmed an optimistic theology that grew out of the crucifixion and then the resurrection. Then news of Martin Luther King Jr.'s death shattered the comfortable security of our academic ivory tower. The whole world descended into chaos. Riots broke out in Durham and across the nation. One night after a two-hour drive from Salisbury to Durham, I had to talk my way past a police barricade just to get to my apartment. There seemed to be very little joy in the kingdom of God. But wine is not just a sign of celebration. It's also one of the two elements of the Eucharist. We still celebrate Holy Communion with a cup of wine or grape juice and the bread of Christ's broken body. It's a moment when Christians rejoice at being close to Jesus and at the same time painfully aware of his suffering and his death. When I think back to those days in the 1960s when segregation ruled our land, I realize how far we have come thanks to men like Martin Luther King, Jr. So much of his dream has come true, and that must give him joy in eternity. 
To be sure, we still have a long way to go. Systemic racism still blocks the way forward for too many Americans. But every public place in America is now open to people of all races. An African American has served as our president. A nearby Providence United Methodist Church has an African American pastor. Somehow in all that social change, I can still feel the kingdom of God becoming a present reality. And that brings joy to my soul. We still live at the dawn of a messianic age. It is both present and future. His vision is right here in this ancient story, and all we have to do is to be like one of those World War II Navajo soldiers. We have to understand the code. I think our key to victory was summed up by Jesus' own mother at the wedding, wedding of Canaan. She said to the servants, <laughs> and that includes all of us who want to be God's servants, do whatever he tells you to do. That's the way forward. Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Love your neighbor. Do more than is expected of you. Go the second mile. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Be ready to lay down your life for a friend and enjoy both here and now and eternally the taste of the new wine only Jesus provides. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our hymn that we will sing following the, ser the sermon is a new one that's printed in the bulletin, but many of you will not have the words to this before you. Let me read a few of the verses. In Cana, at a wedding feast, Christ worked his first great sign. Their Jesus' mother told her son, they don't have any wine. He called for six stone water jars. They filled them to the brim. Through water changed to wine that day, his friends believed in him. Far from the town, the crowds pressed in on Jesus' prayer retreat. He healed the sick, then held his own. You give them food to eat. Five loaves of bread and two small fish were all they found to share. Yet thousands ate the meal he blessed with baskets left to spare. And then the final verse. O Lord, we see your wondrous signs and know through faith-filled eyes you are new wine that brings us joy, true bread that satisfies. You give clear vision to your church. You make the wounded whole. You give us hope when seas are rough, for you are in control. Let's sing together.
the meal he blessed with baskets left to share. Out on the sea the winds were strong, the stormy waves are high. There Jesus' friends were filled with fear when he came walking. affirming our faith as we use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for safe places to weather the storms of life. We are particularly grateful this morning for warm fires, hot food, and the chance to electronically worship together. The challenges of snow and ice make us aware of those who are homeless and those who have lost electric power and those who face unexpected medical issues. Protect the emergency personnel who even now are at great risk on our behalf and protect us with good sense to stay home until improving weather and conditions warrant otherwise. We praise and thank you, O Lord, for feeding us with your word this morning we have tasted the new wine of your gracious love and have felt the presence of your Holy Spirit that still leaves our hearts strangely warm. 
We pray for the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, the prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all who suffer. <clears throat> we particularly pray for COVID-19 patients, both here and around the world. In the isolation of illness, may they feel your presence and our love and know that they are not alone. We especially pray today for Bobby Jones in the death of his daughter, Adrian. We pray for Jim Ogle and Jean Marie Burton as they recover from surgery. For our friends, Judy Fowler, Susan Coley's mother and Amy Foote's mother, Jim Martin and Debbie Carter, Carmen Shepler and George Hines. And for all those we name before you now, whether aloud with our lips or silently within the sanctuaries of our heart. Finally, we pray for peace in our world. We pray for peace here in our own country where political differences too often lead to hatred and violence. We pray for peace in our school where too, where too often the sound of gunfire is louder than the voice of education. We pray for peace in places like the Ukraine where ever expanding armies threaten their neighbors with deadly destruction. And we pray for peace in our own families where disagreements result in separation and silence. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Having been reminded through the Holy Scripture of the spiritual gifts that God has richly given us and the challenge to dig deeper into discipleship and joyful obedience in Christ's kingdom, let us also be faithful stewards in returning a portion of which God has bestowed upon us. You may mail your gift to First United Methodist Church or make your gift through our church website. This week also, I have heard that Rowan Helping Ministries is desperately strapped for volunteers because COVID has invaded the shelter. If you have some time to go to Jeannie's Kitchen to help with a meal, please call Caroline and let her know. Thank you.
Now go forth to serve God with patience and passion. Be deliberate in enacting your faith. Be steadfast in celebrating the Spirit's power. And may peace be with you and your way in the world. Amen. Thank you.